Hey DCF, Pastor Brad here. Hope you had a fantastic weekend. Hope you're having a great start to another week. And as we launch into another Monday, or whenever it is that you're watching this video in the course of the week, I uh, just want to remind you that the main reason that we are putting out these videos for you every single week is to encourage you to continue to pursue Jesus Christ within your life, to view him as the greatest pursuit uh, of, of all the things that you could give yourself to. We obviously spend a lot of time investing in things. Our education, um, our building up of a, a nest egg, a retirement, a, a working on our house and making our houses as nice as they can be. We, we invest in our parenting and in our friendships and in our exercise. We invest in a lot. And a lot of those things are good and, and worthwhile things to be investing in. But there's nothing more more important than the time that you will spend investing in your relationship with God. For as we will talk about today in the Heidelberg Catechism, what happens in this life now is just a foretaste of what will be ours in the life to come. Um, eternity is something that's really impossible for us to wrap our minds around. But just to even begin to try to think about an eternal life, eternity with God, gives us a helpful perspective on even a life that is long lived on this earth, 80, 90 years. That sounds like a long time, right? I'm turning 40 this year, big, big four zero. That's about halfway to 80. Feels like a long time. Feels like I've been a lot alive for a long time and I got another life to go, maybe. God only knows. But compare that to eternity and it's nothing. And so we are investing in that which will be eternal. Our relationship with God, our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who is our friend, who desires to walk with us through the thick and thin of life, through the, the struggles and the joys. He is our God. He is our holy, holy and almighty God. But he is also our counselor, our our friend, our redeemer who is walking with us every step of the way. And so we are invited to enter into the joy of his presence through his word as God's word is what speaks to us and to return back our, our thoughts and our words through prayer as that is a relational component uh, of speaking and listening, right? That's how we develop relationships with people. We talk, they listen, they talk, we listen, we learn, we grow, we love, we we cry together. These are all parts of developing a strong relationship. And so this week, may you see the fostering of your relationship with Jesus as the most important thing you can do. And may you prioritize that uh, every day so that your relationship with him continues to grow. I'm coming to you today with Lord's Day 38 of the Heidelberg Catechism. We are plugging along. We're now on the fourth commandment of the Ten Commandments that, again, come from Exodus 20. And falls within the third section of the catechism as we talk about sin, salvation, service, and guilt, grace, gratitude, and the law of God. I just love that that is in the third part because it shows us how to live a life of gratitude for the salvation that is ours. Of course, the gospel message is that we cannot earn our salvation, our justification, not based on anything that we do, but that doesn't mean that obedience doesn't matter, right? As we said yesterday in the sermon, as we say continually, the works of our life, the obedience of our life, it matters because though we're justified by faith alone, true faith is never alone. It's always accompanied by a heart that now desires to live for God. And of course, there's growth in obedience. There's growth in, this is what our sanctification is. We're continually being conformed more and more to the image and likeness of Jesus. And so there are things in my life right now that I'm not even seeing, that I'm blinded to. They're in my blind spot of ways that my life needs to be conformed. And God in his good timing as I spend time in relationship, again, this is why seeing it as a relationship is so helpful, is he shows me the things that need to be conformed, need to grow and develop in conformity to Christ. And so the law is good for us in that reason. So the fourth commandment is is all about not doing anything. It's, well, sort of. It's about resting. Fourth commandment. Here it is. Exodus 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant, your livestock or the sojourner who is in within your gates. For in six days the Lord God made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them. 
and rested on the seventh day. And here's the way that the catechism then interprets what that means for our life now. And we'll talk about how in just a moment, you know, this commandment falls in the Old Testament within the Old Covenant. Um, it even goes back further than that, than the Old Covenant, uh, because it was a, a creation principle. But the catechism's answer comes in the context of the New Covenant, as we see kind of all the ways in which Jesus and the gospel interacts with this command. And, and here's how it says, here's what it says the Lord's Day, the fourth commandment means for us. What is God's will for you in the fourth commandment? First, that the gospel ministry and education for it be maintained. And that especially on the festive day of rest, I regularly attend the assembly of God's people to learn what God's word teaches, to participate in the sacraments, to pray to God publicly, and to bring Christian offerings for the poor. Go to church. Go to church and worship. This is this is the, the first part of the answer, but it's got a second part. And this is what I read in the Sermon on God's Rest several weeks ago in Genesis 2. Second, that every day of my life, I rest from my evil ways. Let the Lord work in me through his spirit, and so begin already in this life, the eternal Sabbath. Okay, so in a few minutes... It's impossible for me to kind of unpack this thing in its entirety, but I want to kind of give you a big picture. Sabbath is everywhere in the scriptures, okay? And if you didn't listen to the Sermon on God's Rest at the end of our series, In the Beginning, God, please listen to that. Um, I didn't even go through everything in that, but I hit it much harder than I can hit it here because there's already in creation a Sabbath principle. The word Sabbath isn't used, but... Uh, Shabbat, to rest, is the verb form uh, of the noun Sabbath. And so uh, that is used in Genesis 2. As God rested, he ceased from his work and created one day in seven to be a day of rest that Adam and Eve and, and all creatures then from that moment on would participate in as God had laid forth a pattern of work six days, rest on the seventh day. So there's a creation pat, uh, principle but that's a common grace principle. It wasn't only available to God's people. It was available to all people. Just like marriage, just like work, just like procreation, Sabbath is available for all people. Common grace extended to all people, whether they trust in God or not. But then there's the Mosaic uh, Sabbath that we see established for Israel, God's people, in Exodus. And, and I mentioned that in the sermon. And we see it here. I read it for you in the Ten Commandments as part of the Mosaic Law. God's people are to be especially concerned with keeping the Sabbath day to model after God what he did in creation. And so there's a ceremonial aspect to um, the Sabbath keeping, the Sabbath day, but it's also part of the moral law. So there's moral law, there's ceremonial law. The ceremonial law was all the feasts and the, the rituals that God's people in the Old Testament would keep. But all of those things we're pointing towards what Christ would do. So Passover, he would be our Passover lamb. Um, the sacrifices that Israel was to make in the temple. Christ was the final sacrifice. There's no more sacrifices. We're not called to uphold the festivals anymore and the feasts. But Sabbath was also one of those regular ceremonial practices. And it pointed forward to something that Christ was going to fulfill. So if Christ fulfilled it, are we no longer called to keep the Sabbath? That's the question. And people disagree all over the place on Sabbath. And, and you see within the Christian church a huge spectrum of how people approach it. For some, it's just a... <laughs> DeYoung says this way. This is funny. It's not funny. Uh, Sunday worship is simply a break between the weekend of Saturday and Sunday. right? So Saturday and Sunday are simply two weekend days. And worship is just an interruption to that to that Saturday that continues for two days. Whereas others on the other end of it are what we would call Sabbatarians. They would hold to a strict observance. There's all these stipulations of what you can and cannot do on the Sabbath. And then everything in between, right? And 
I'm out of time. But the Sabbath, the, the Lord's Day in the Heidelberg Catechism kind of emphasizes two things. Worship, that's a priority. Go hear God's word, pray, participate in the sacraments, give your offerings. These are the common, ordinary means of grace in which God builds our faith. Do that regularly. That ought to be a part of your Sabbath rest. Um, and then rest. Rest physically, but as a as a also rest every other day from your sinful ways. And you're beginning in this life the practice of what life will be like in the eternal Sabbath rest, the perfect rest of God that God has been in since Genesis 2, that we will enter into into the new heavens and the new earth. And so, um, you know, what should we, should we not do? That's what everyone wants to know. Tell me, Pastor, what should I do? What should I not do? Uh, and then I'll decide if I agree with you or not. Um, I think it, too easily in our culture, especially for Christians, Sabbath day has become like any other day. And so the Sunday, the, the Lord's Day, my encouragement would be to you, especially those of you who have children, protect this day, protect it, hold in the highest regard, coming to church and worshiping God with his people on Sunday. Don't let anything get in the way of that. Don't let sports. I know there's debate. Can we play sports on Sunday? I think absolutely you can play sports on Sunday, but not to the extent of missing church. And I know that's, you know. I know that's tough uh, for some because it's like, should my kid play sports? Well, their kid plays sports on Sunday. Um, prioritize worship. Don't miss worship. Um, and, and I would even say that doesn't mean, hey, just do it online so that I can quick get to my game. Be in the house of the Lord with his people on Sunday. Do everything you can to protect that day. Um, and then do everything else that you can to make that day a day of rest. And, and what the rest is a foreshadow of is the rest that is ours to come in the new heavens, the new earth. I just want to close by reading this last paragraph of this chapter. If you don't have this book, again, get this book, The Good News We Almost Forgot by Kevin DeYoung. The end of this chapter, page 182, says this. So, yes, we still need to obey the fourth commandment, but we need to see how Jesus transforms it. He gives us the substance instead of the shadow, the Old Testament feasts and and uh, ceremonies were shadows. Christ is the, the fulfillment of that shadow. He is the, um, the type that allows us to see what the, or he is the anti-type. Never mind about that. But he fulfills what the, he makes the shadow clear. Shadows are outlines, but they don't have clarity. He clarifies what was uh, hinted at in the shadows. Jesus transforms it. He gives us a substance instead of the shadow. Trust was the point of the mosaic shadows, just like offerings yesterday. They reveal the trust of our heart. But now the substance is here. Sabbath rest is about making Jesus Christ the center of who we are and relying on him alone for our salvation. It means ceasing to find approval and righteousness in our deeds, even in our rest. It means we stop doubting God's promises and start trusting the spiritual vitality. That spiritual vitality is found only by resting in him. Keeping the Sabbath means we give up on ourselves and give ourselves over to God, letting the Lord work in us through his spirit and so begin already in this life, the eternal Sabbath. Have a great week loving and serving the Lord, and I'll see you on Sunday.